Chapter 18 The Philosophy of Life I visited this man three times in all. He lived in a prestigious dacha community not far from Moscow. His two sons, who hold some sort of fairly high positions in the government hierarchy, built their aging father a large two-story mansion and hired a housekeeper to look after both the house and their father. At best, they come to see their father once a year on his birthday. His name is Nikolai Fyodorovich, and he's already in his seventies. His legs ache and so almost the whole time he sits in his imported wheelchair. His huge mansion is designed in the best European style, with half the ground floor taken up by his study with its multitudes of shelves home to a considerable collection of books in a variety of languages. Most of these books are on philosophy, in expensive leather bindings. Before his retirement, Nikolai Fyodorovich taught philosophy at a prestigious Moscow university and has several academic degrees. In his more senior years, he settled into this mansion and spends almost all of his time in his study, reading and reflecting. I got to know him thanks to the persistence of his housekeeper Galina, who came to one of my readers' conferences. I am grateful to her for introducing us. Nikolai Fyodorovich had read the books about Anastasia, and he was a most interesting chap to talk with. In spite of his academic degrees, this old fellow could explain in simple, straightforward terms things that had not always been clear to me in Anastasia's sayings, as well as reveal new aspects he had discovered in them. After the publication of my third book, The Space of Love, the office of the Anastasia Foundation forwarded several letters to me written by leaders of various religious denominations aggressively denouncing Anastasia, calling her a fool and a scoundrel. One of them even wrote a long letter replete with obscene language. I was at a loss to understand why Anastasia had suddenly started provoking such unmitigated aggression among certain religious leaders, and so I decided to send some of these letters along to Nikolai Fyodorovich for his opinion. Two months later, his housekeeper Galina came to see me, having looked me up at my hotel. She was very distraught and pleaded with me to come see Nikolai Fyodorovich right away as she was concerned about his health. It was hard to resist Galina's insistence. Galina had a gorgeous, solid physique. Not fat, she was simply a large and physically strong Russian woman in her early forties. She had spent her whole life in some Ukrainian village, driving trucks and tractors and looking after cows. She was an excellent cook with a good knowledge of herbs and was extremely neat. Whenever she got excited, she would lapse into her thick Ukrainian accent. I have no idea how Nikolai Fyodorovich's son happened to find her and set her up as a nursemaid to their father, but it was curious to see this aging intellectual, a, prof a philosophy professor, talking with a countrywoman of limited educational background. Galina had been allocated a room of her own in the mansion. It would have been fine for her simply to look after the household affairs. She did this quite well. But she couldn't help listening to what Nikolai Fyodorovich and I were saying to each other. She would invariably think up something that needed doing in our presence and start dusting a particular spot over and over again, all the while commenting aloud on what she was hearing, as though talking to herself. This time, Galina had come to collect me in the Neva, which Nikolai Fyodorovich's son had purchased so she could go grocery shopping in the, in the town when necessary, or drive into the woods to gather herbs or fetch medicines for their father. I dropped what I was working on and went with her. Driving through the streets of Moscow, Galina was very quiet. She looked tense behind the wheel, and I even noticed drops of sweat on her face, until we got past the outer ring road. Once she found herself on familiar route, she breathed a noticeable sigh of relief. Now she was much more relaxed behind the wheel and started quickly telling me about all of her concerns in the mixture of Ukrainian and Russian. He was sure quiet back then. The man would sit the whole live long day just quietly in his wheelchair, reading books and thinking to himself. I'd make up hominy grits or oatmeal for him for every morning. I'd feed him and I'd, I could go then to the market or maybe into the woods to get some herbs for his health, you know. I could go with a clear conscious see, knowing 
He'd be sitting in that chair of his, thinking his thoughts or reading a book. But now it's all different. I brought him the letters you sent. He read them. Just two days after that, he says to me, Take some money, Galina Nikiforovna. Go and buy some of those Anastasia books and then go to market. No need to hurry home. Stay there at the market and watch the people. As soon as you see somebody who looks sad or sick, give him a book. I did this once, even twice, but there was no way he'd quiet down. Don't worry about my dinner, Galina Nikiforovna, he said. I'll make do myself if I get hungry. But I still always made it home in time for dinner. But the other day, when I got home from the market, I went to his book room as usual to give him some herbal tea. And hey, his chair's empty, and if he ain't lying there face down on the carpet. I rush over to the telephone and grab the receiver to dial the doctor's number, just like his sons told me to. They even gave me a special number, not the one everybody uses. So I call up and cry, help, to the telephone. And just then he lifts his head and says to me, cancel the call, Galina Nik Nikiforovna. I'm okay. I'm just doing some exercises, push-ups. So I dash over to him, pick, up, pick him plumb off the floor, and set him back in his chair. How'd he ever get himself up off the floor with those aching legs of his? What kind of exercise is it, I say to him, when someone just lay on the floor? He replies, I'd already done my exercises and was just resting. No need for you to worry your little head over. The next day, he'd gotten out of his chair again and onto the floor to do exercises. So I went out and bought him some dumbbells. Not dumbbells exactly, something called an expander with handles and elastic bands. You can hook up just one band to make it easier, four when you got a bit more strength. I bought him this expander, see, but he still keeps trying to get up out of his chair, just like a little kid who don't know how to do any better. His heart ain't too young, and seeing it ain't too young. He shouldn't try things too heavy all at once. He has to do it one step at a time, but he's just like a foolish child. It's pretty near five years I've been working for him now, and nothing like this ever happened before, and I haven't a clue myself as to what's going on in my heart. You have, to, you have to have a talk with him. Tell him at least to go easy on his exercises if he likes them so much. Tell him to go easy. When I entered Nikolai Fyodorovich's spacious study, the hearth was cheerily ablaze. The old philosophy professor was not sitting in his wheelchair as usual, but at his large desk, writing or sketching out something. Even his outward appearance told me something was different about him. He was not wearing his customary dressing gown, but sported a proper shirt and tie. He greeted me with a more, vig more vigor than usual, quickly invited me to take a seat, and bypassing the traditional how are you, started in talking. Nikolai Fyodorovich spoke fervently, passionately. Do you know, Vladimir, what marvelous times are coming upon our earth? I don't want to die. I want to live on this kind of earth. I've read the letters with all those obscenities directed at Anastasia. Thank, for, thank you for passing them along to me. In many respects, it was a real eye-opener. They call Anastasia a tiger recluse, an enchantress, a sorceress, whereas in fact she is a warrior par excellence. Indeed, just think about it, Anastasia is a warrior par excellence for the forces of light. Her significance and greatness are something that will be appreciated by future generations. The human consciousness, mind, and feelings expressed in the sagas, folk tales, and legends that have been passed down to us were incapable of imagining the greatness of this warrior. Only please don't be surprised, Vladimir. Don't get touchy as you usually do about Anastasia. Yes, she is man. She is a woman endowed with all, and I mean all, of human nature, with all the feminine weaknesses and virtues designed to be a mother, but at the same time she is also a great warrior right this moment. I shall try to express myself not quite so abstrusely. It all comes down to the philosophical concept. You see, Vladimir, on the shelves of my study there are a great many books. These are philosophical works of thinkers of different times and from different parts of the globe. Pointing to his bookshelves, Nikolai Fyodorovich listed them off one by one. That's ancient rhetoric, talking about the living, animated body of the cosmos. Next to that is what's been written about Socrates. He himself didn't write anything. 
Over to the right, you see Lucretius, Plutarch, and Marcus Aurelius. A little lower down are five ep epic poems of Nasami Ganjavi. Further along, there are Arani, Des Descartes, um, Franklin, Kant, Laplace, Hegel, and Stendhal. All of these men attempted to learn the central essence of things, to fathom the laws of the universe. It was people such as these Durant was referring to when he wrote, The history of philosophy is essentially an account of the efforts great men have made to avert social disintegration by building up natural moral sanctions to take the place of the supernatural sanctions which they themselves have destroyed. Great thinkers, Nikolai Fyodorovich continued, have attempted, each in their own way, to get closer to the concept of the absolute. Their philosophical concepts gave rise to the religion-like philosophical tendencies, which in turn passed into history. Eventually, having defied all the timid counter-attempts, the dominant concept in our lifetime has turned out to be, to put it concisely, the concept of subjection to some kind of supreme mind. Its precise location is unimportant, be it in the infinite spaces of the universe or localized in the essence of a particular human soul. Much more important is the fact that the concept of subjection or inclination dominates over everything else. After that come the particulars, subjection to a teacher, a mentor, or a ritual. My collections also include Nostradamus's prophecies. Taken as a whole, they constitute a philosophical concept, namely that man is perishable, corruptible, and insignificant, and that he has a lot to learn. This concept is precisely what distorts and destroys the, the soul of man. No one who adheres to this concept can be truly happy. Not a single person on the earth can be happy as long as such a concept is dominant in man's consciousness. It weighs equally upon the philosopher and the one who has never gone near philosophy in his life. It weighs equally upon the newborn and the aged. It weighs upon the fetus and the mother's womb. Many adherents of this concept are living today. They have been around at different times, and today their followers are proselytizing human society with their beliefs in the frailty and insignificance of man's essence. But no, other times are upon us. Anastasia's words from God were like a flash of light to me. You wrote them down, Vladimir. I remember them. When Adam asked God, Where is the edge of the universe? What will I do when I come to it? When I, when I myself fill everything and have created everything I have conceived. And God replied to his son, replied to us all, My son, the universe itself is a thought, a thought from which was born a dream, which is partially visible as matter. When you approach the edge of all creation, your thought will reveal a new beginning and continuation. From obscurity will arise a new and resplendent birth of you, and it will reflect in itself your soul, your dreams, your whole aspirations. My son, you are infinite. You are eternal. Within you are your dreams of creation. What a perfect, philosophically comprehensive, precise, and concise response that explains it all. It stands head and shoulders above all our philosophical definitions taken together. You can see for yourself, Vladimir, the vast collection of books on my library shelves. But the one book which is worth far more than all the volumes ever published on philosophy taken together is missing. Many have seen this book, but few are afforded the opportunity to read it. The language of this book is not one that can be studied, but it can be felt. What language is that? The language of God, Vladimir. May I remind you of how Anastasia described it? The peoples of the earth have so many words with different meanings. There are so many diverse languages and dialects, and yet there is one language for all. The language for all divine callings. It is woven together out of the rustlings of the leaves, the songs of the birds, and the roar of the waves. The divine language have, has fragrance and color. Through this language, God responds to each one's request and gives a prayerful response to prayer. Anastasia can feel and understand this language. But what about us? 
How can it be that we have let it go unheeded for centuries? Think of the logic. Cold logic dictates that if God created the earth and the nature that lives all around us, then every blade of grass, every tree and cloud, the water and the stars, can only be his materialized thoughts. But we simply pay no attention to them. We trample them, break them, disfigure them, all the while talking about our faith. What kind of faith is that? Who are we really worshipping? The parade of the worldly rulers, no matter what grand temples they might have built, will be remembered only by the filth they have bequeathed to their descendants. Water will prove to be the criterion, the measure of all things. Every day that passes, water seethes with more and more contamination. That's how Anastasia put it. That could only have been said by a consummate philosopher, and it behooves all all of us just to ponder that statement. Just think, Vladimir, anything we construct, even if it is for worship, is temporal, just like religion itself. Religions come and go along with their temples and philosophies. Water has existed since the creation of all the world, just as we have. After all, we too are composed, by and large, of water. But Nikolai Fyodorovich, why do you think Anastasia's definitions are the most accurate? Because they are taken from that one book that covers everything. And their logic, Vladimir, is the logic of philosophy. There's one preceding statement given in God's name, in which God answers the question, What do you so fervently desire? And his answer is directed to every single entity in the universe. Conjoint creation and joy for all from its contemplation. Just one brief sentence, only a few words, that's all. Just a few words to express God's aspiration and desire. None of the great philosophers have been able to give a more precise and accurate definition. One must perceive reality through oneself, says Anastasia. So any parent who loves their children should determine whether this may, may not be what they are really dreaming about. Who among us, being the son or the daughter of God, would not desire conjoint creation with our children and joy from its contemplation? What consummate power and wisdom are contained in these philosophical definitions of Anastasia's? They are absolutely crucial for mankind. They are effective. The host of doomsayers have lined themselves up, up against them. They will continue to manifest themselves, not just in the form of cursing Anastasia in correspondence, but in a variety of ways. Many small-minded preachers will gather a fistful of follower, followers around them and look as if they are preaching truth to people. People who are too lazy to think for themselves. Anastasia has already said about these, Woe unto you who call yourselves teachers of human souls. Cool the passions of your heart, and may everyone now know the Creator has given all to each one right from the start. The truth has been there right from the start in each one's soul, and we need only to re refrain from hiding the Creator's great creations under the murky domain of dogma and conventions, the murk of inventions for the sake of one's own selfish interests. These are the people Anastas who will try to pounce on Anastasia, because Anastasia is utterly destroying their philosophy. With her own philosophical concepts, she is actually forestalling the end of the world. And this is our reality today. We are witnessing and participating in the greatest deed of all time. Here we are at the threshold of a new millennium, and we are entering upon a new reality. We are already living in this reality. Wait, Nikolai Fyodorovich. I didn't get what you said about reality and deeds. Let's say one or maybe two philosophers said something. And Anastasia says it too. What have reality and deeds got to do with it? It's all just words. Philosophers talk and life goes on unfolding in its own way. The life of any human society has always been constructed as if as it is today, under the influence of philosophical concepts. The Jewish philosophy was one way of life. The Crusaders' philosophy was another. Hitler had his own philosophy, and we, under the Soviet regime, had ours. Revolution, after all, is only one philosophical concept taking the place of another. 
but all that amounts to details determined by local conditions. What Anastasia has accomplished is much more global in scale. It has an impact on human society as a whole and on each, each member of society in particular. She said she would transport mankind across the dark forces window of time. She has done this, Vladimir. She has set up a bridge over the abyss which everyone may cross, and each one is free to decide whether to go across it or not. I am a philosopher, Vladimir. I can now see this very clearly. What's more, I can feel it. Her philosophical concept shines like a clear ray of light on the threshold of a new millennium. And each one of us, at any given moment, acts this way or that, depending on our individual philosophical convictions. If these change, then our actions change accordingly. As I was sitting in my study, for example, and reading through various philosophical works, I pitied all mankind, inevitably moving toward its doom. I wondered where I would be buried and would my sons and grandchildren come to my funeral, or whether it would be too much trouble for them to come see their grandfather. I pitied all mankind, and I thought of my own death. And then along came Anastasia, with an entirely different philosophical concept, and my actions took, about turn, took an about turn. How would you do things differently now, for example? Well, I'll tell you. Now, now when I get up in the morning, I start acting in accord with my new philosophical concept. Nikolai Fyodorovich got up, bracing his arms against the table. Then, holding on first to the chair, then a bookshelf, he managed to make his way on his aching legs over to the bookcases. He looked at the titles on each spine, then pulled out one book in an expensive leather binding and headed over to the fireplace, leaning on various pieces of furniture. As he went, tossing the book into the blazing hearth, he explained, Those are the prophecies of Nostradamus about all sorts of cataclysms in the end of the world. Do you remember, Vladimir, Anastasia's words on this? You should remember them. She says, The dates you gave, Nostradamus, for fearful cataclysms on the earth were not predictions. You created them out of your own thought and persuaded people to accept their implementation. Now they are still hovering over the earth, still frightening people with their sense of despair. This could only have been said by a consummate philosopher and thinker, who one who understands that prophecy is nothing more than an attempt to set a direction for future developments. The more people believe in universal doom, the greater will be the number of thoughts attempting to outline the image, and it will come to pass. It can come to pass simply because human thought is material and creates what is material, and whole sects immolate themselves in different parts of the world, that is, the ones who believe in doom and immolate themselves, while the ones who have faith in the future live. And she is fearless in the face of despair. She completely destroys any notion of the end of the world when she declares, but now they will no longer come true. Let your thought join in fray with mine. I am man. Anastasia, I am. And I am stronger than you. And again, she says, all anger on earth. Leave your deeds and make haste to, to me. Join fray with me. Try your utmost. And again, with my ray, I shall take. But as a moment to burn up the murk of age-old dogma. She alone has gone out to fight against the countless hordes, against the millions who outline an image of mankind's total doom. And she doesn't want to involve us in this fight. She only wants us to be happy, and so she says in her prayer addressed to God, In your bright dream, the coming ages, all will live and share. It shall be so. I wish it so. I am a daughter of yours. My father, you are present everywhere and she will get her wish. Her philosophy is extraordinarily potent, and the coming ages will indeed live in the divine dream, in splendid gardens of paradise, and she will not distract anyone with memories of herself. People will not build monuments to her, nor reminisce about her when, she, when it is clear to everyone where true humanity lies. 
People will simply drink in the divine nature. They won't be thinking about her, but flowers will bloom in various gardens, including one splendid flower named Anastasia. I am old, but I am willing to serve as her foot soldier, even today. You say, Vladimir, that philosophy is just a bunch of words, but these words spoken somewhere in the far-off taiga have been enthusiastically taken in by, by my heart. And here you have first-hand evidence of concrete material actions. It is not mankind that is perishing in the flames, but predictions of the doom of humanity. That is why the doomsayers are all stirred up and have set their forces in array. Anastasia has stirred up people who have built their philosophy on such a scenario and manipulated mankind for their own purposes, with the threat of the inevitable end of the world. Hasn't anyone before, Anastasia, come out against the notion of the end of the world? There have been a few timid but ultimately insignificant attempts, but they've hardly received any attention. Nobody, but nobody has spoken out as she has. Nobody's words have been accepted so readily and joyfully as hers, in any human heart, and not a single philosophical concept has ever taken hold of people this way. But hers has taken hold. It is burning up the murk of the old age dogma. How she does it? Well, that's not for us to grasp at the moment. There's an extraordinary rhythm in her words, and a consummate logic, possibly something else. Possibly. No, undoubtedly. The Creator, she says, has shown forth with some kind of new energy. An energy that tells us anew about something we see around us every day. Undoubtedly, a new energy has made its appearance in the universe, and more and more people in our time are starting to possess it day by day. The fact is that decades and possibly even centuries as a rule are required to spread a significant philosophical concept. And here, it's only taken her a few years. Amazing. You surmise, Vladimir, that her words were simply words, but her words are so strong that you see... You see these hands? He raised one of his hands, looked at it, and added, Even these old hands of mine are materializing her words. And the whole prospect of the end of the world is burning up in flames, and life will go on. These hands can still help life go on. The hands of one of Anastasia's foot soldiers. Holding on to the furniture, Nikolai Fyodorovich made his way over to the table and picked up a pitcher of water. Bracing himself with one hand against the wall, he headed over to the window. It was a challenge, but he made it. On the window sill stood a beautiful flower pot in which a green shoot, still very young, was sprouting up from the earth. Look, my baby cedar's come up at last, and now my hands will water it, materializing the words that are close to my heart. Bracing one hip against the windowsill, Nikolai Fyodorovich grasped the pitcher with both hands and said, The water isn't too cold for you, my dear. After a moment's thought, he took a swallow of the water, held it in his mouth for a little while, and then, resting his hands on the windowsill, let a thin stream of water spew from his mouth onto the earth beside the green shoot. Galina was in the study during our conversation. She was always thinking up some excuse to be in his study. She would bring tea or start dusting, all the while muttering quietly to herself, commenting on what she had heard and seen. These last actions of Nikolai Fyodorovich evoked a rather louder comment than usual. Now what's the point of that? Any decent person might wonder. Here he goes doing tricks like that in his old age, and won't ride in his wheelchair, he goes and tortures his aging legs, making him walk like that, and somehow people ain't satisfied. Here it is, nice and warm and comfy at home, but it ain't enough for them, just ain't enough. I remembered Galina being concerned about Nikolai Fyodorovich's health and asking me to warn him about something. Only now I couldn't figure out what there was to warn him about, and I asked him, What have you thought up this time, Nikolai Fyodorovich? He was a bit emotional, but said distinctively, distinctly, I have a big favor to request of you, Vladimir. I ask you only to respect an old man's wishes. Go ahead, I'll be happy to oblige if I can. 
I've heard you say you're planning to get people together who want to start building an ecological settlement. You want to see about having a hectare of land granted each family to set up as a kin's domain. Yes, I do. The Anastasia Foundation has already submitted a proposal to several regional administrations about this. But there's been no decision on land grants as yet. They've offered a few mil small allotments just for a handful of families each, but unless we have a minimum of 150 families, we shan't be able to afford the cost of any infrastructure. They'll grant the land, Vladimir. Most definitely they'll grant it. That would be good, but what about this favor you want? When they start handing out land for Kin's Domain, and they'll definitely be doing this all over Russia, I would ask you, Vladimir, not to forget about an old man. Please don't forget to count me in. I, too, want to establish my own piece of the motherland before I die. Nikolai Fyodorovich started getting more and more excited. His words came quickly and with passion. To establish it for myself, for my children and grandchildren. See, I'm growing my own baby cedar in this pot, so I can plant the seedling in a piece of my motherland with my own hands. I shan't be a burden to anyone. I'll set everything up on my own hectare of land. I'll put in a garden and a plant a living fence. I'll be able to help my neighbors. I have some savings, and I keep receiving honoraria for various articles. My sons, whatever else you say about them, they never refuse any financial help. I'll build myself a little house there, and I can help finance construction for my neighbors. Now that'll be a fine sight to see, Galena was muttering even louder than before. People don't stop to think of it. How can you plant a garden when your legs don't move? And here he's planning on helping his neighbors. Oh, if decent folk could only hear that. What would decent folk think? Here his sons have built him a house like this. He, ju he should just live and be happy and thank his sons for and God for it. But people just can't sit still. They gotta keep thinking up things like that right into their old age. What might decent folk think about people like that? Nikolai Fyodorovich heard what Galina said, but didn't pay any attention to her, or at least pretended to ignore her and went on. I realize, Vladimir, that my decisions may be treated as excess excessive emotional emotionalism, but that's not how it is. My decision is the fruit of extensive reflection. I may appear to enjoy a fine life, but that's only an appearance. I have a mansion fully equipped, practically a palace. I've got a housekeeper to take care of it. My sons have done pretty well for themselves. But you know, before learning about Anastasia, I was as good as dead. Yes, Vladimir, dead. Look, I've been living here for over four years now. I spend most of my time in my study. I'm useful to no one, and there's literally nothing I can have an impact on. And the same fate awaits my sons and grandchildren. It's the fate of experiencing your death while you're still alive. They call man dead, Vladimir, when he stops breathing. But that's not the case. Man dies the moment he stops being useful to others and is no longer in charge of anything. The neighbors' houses around here aren't quite so grand. But I don't have any friends among them. And my sons have asked me not to announce my name even to the neighbors. There are a lot of jealous types about, wondering whose house this is, a house that's practically a palace. Once they find out, they'll splash my name all over the media, inquiring how I managed to finance this setup. They'll never believe it was my own hard-earned money. The way I sit here, I may as well be in prison or even dead. I just sit here in my study, never go upstairs. There's no reason for me to. Certainly, I have a lot of philosophical pu publications to my name, but after finding out, out about Anastasia... I'll tell you right off, Vladimir, and please don't take what I say as a fantasy of old age. I'll prove to you what I'm about to say is true. You realize, Vladimir, right now, right at this very moment, God's judgment is coming to pass. Judgment? But where and how? Why doesn't anybody know about this? You realize, Vladimir... For so long, we've imagined this judgment to be on the coming of some kind of terrible being from on high with its terrible entourage, and this supreme being is supposed to tell each of us where we've been right and wrong. Then, the supreme being is supposed to mete out punishment in due measure, sending whoever's being judged to either heaven or hell. 
How primitively we've pictured God's judgment. But God isn't some primitive creature. He can't judge that way. He has given man eternal freedom, and any kind of judgment is a violation of one's person. It's a deprivation of freedom. Then what did you mean when you said something about God's judgment coming to pass right this very moment? And I'll say it again. God's judgment is coming to pass right this very moment. Everyone is given the opportunity to judge himself. I realize now what Anastasia has done. Her philosophy, power, and logic are speeding up the processes. Just think, Vladimir, many people will believe her and bring the idea of these splendid divine communities to fruition. Once they believe, they'll find themselves in a garden of paradise. Others won't believe and will remain where they are now. Everything in the world is relative. At the moment, we are not in a position to compare our life with any other and so we think our lifestyle is tolerable. But when it is put side by side with another kind of life, when the unbelievers finally believe, they will see themselves in hell. Some people count themselves happy simply because they don't know how unhappy they really are. God's judgment is coming to pass right before our eyes. But it is strange to our way of thinking. This isn't just my discovery. I know this psychologist in Novosibirsk who's undertaken a study of how various population groups react to Anastasia's sayings. She said practically the same thing. I don't know her personally, I've only read her conclusions in print, and they're similar to my own. People in various cities and towns are feeling and realizing the majesty of what's ta been taking place. Professor Yeriominkin, whose poems have been published in the People's Collection, in another one who's described the Anastasia phenomenon in magnificent verse. I'd like to remind you, Vladimir, of these lines he dedicated to Anastasia. In you I have beheld a man quite clearly, possibly from the end of another era, where midst goddesses my own grandchildren too will be an embodiment of you. I memorize these beautiful lines. I want my grandchildren, too, to live among the goddesses, and therefore I want to, be, to provide this opportunity for them. I want to begin establishing for them a piece of our splendid motherland. Just to buy a piece of property, even more than one hectare in size, is no problem for me. But it is important to me who my neighbors are. And so I want to set up my property in a circle of people who share my way of thinking to set it up for my grandchildren. One of them will most certainly want to live there, and my sons will want to come and rest there in their father's garden from the bustle of daily life. At the moment they come and see me only on rare occasions, but they will come to the garden I shall set up. I shall ask that I be buried in this garden. My sons will come. I am talking about my grandchildren, my sons. But above all, I need to create something inherent in the essence of man. Otherwise, you see, Vladimir, all at once I have acquired the desire to live and be active. I can do it. I shall become a foot soldier and enlist in Anastasia's cause. You can live just as well right where you are. Why don't you just live out a good quiet life right here, Galina inquired. This time Nikolai Fyodorovich took it upon himself to reply. He turned to her and said, I can understand your concern, Galina Nikiforovna. You're afraid of losing your job and a roof over your head. Please don't worry. I'll help you build a little house nearby. You'll have your own little house and your own plot of land. You'll get married. You'll find the one meant just for you. All at once, Galina straightened up to her full height, threw her white rag down on the side table. The rag she had been pretending to dust with all during our conversation, and placed her hands on the solidly built on her th solidly built thighs. She looked as though she wanted to say something but couldn't, as though her emotional state had cut short her breath. Then, mustering up her strength, she managed to pronounce quietly, "Well, maybe I don't like the idea of being close to a neighbor like you. Anyways, I can build my own house just as soon as I get my land." When I was a kid, I helped my father build a log cabin, and I've saved up a pretty penny. Besides, working around here ain't so pleasant. 
Who is there to clean up for day after day upstairs? Nobody ever goes upstairs, yet here I am cleaning up like a damn fool after nobody. I don't want to live in a neighborhood if the neighbors don't have their heads screwed on right. Galena did a sharp about turn and quickly headed off to her room. But presently the door of her room opened and Galena reappeared in the doorway, holding in her hands two little pots with green shoots just like those in Nikolai Fyodorovich's fancy pot. She walked over to the window sill and put her little pots down next to his on the window sill. Then she returned to her room and brought out a large basket filled with a whole lot of little cloth bundles. She placed the basket at Nikolai Fyodor Fyodorovich's feet and said, Them seeds, real ones, because I gathered them as myself all summer long and right through the fall. They're from real medicinal herbs, the ones they sow in the fields to sell at pharmacies. They ain't got the power of these here. Just scatter them with your own hand on your land. They'll multiply your health and strength. When they're growing and when you make an herbal tea with them and drink them in the winter time. Besides, that baby cedar of yours, it's going to be lonely. Well, there's some friends and a brother for it. Galena pointed to the window sill where the three pots with little shoots were now standing and then walked slowly to the front door, calling over her shoulder. Goodbye, philosophers. Maybe you already know the philosophy of death, but as for the philosophy of life, you've still got a lot to learn. As far as anyone could tell, Galena had been deeply offended by something, and she was walking away for good. Nikolai Fyodorovich took a step to follow her, but stumbled. Then he tried to catch himself by reaching out for the back of a chair, but the chair fell over. Nikolai Fyodorovich started to sway back and forth, flinging his arms out to the side. I jumped up to offer him a hand, but I was too late. Galina, who by this time had already reached the door of the room, turned at the noise of the falling chair and saw Nikolai Fyodorovich swaying back and forth. Quick as a wink, she was at his side. With her strong arms, she managed to grasp the old man whose legs had already given way beneath him and stood there holding him to her bosomy breast. Wriggling one hand free, she picked up Nikolai Fyodorovich by the legs and carried him like a child to his wheelchair. She sat him down in it and looked, and then took hold of a plaid rug and began covering his legs, gently chastising him. Some soldier of Anastasia you are. You ain't no soldier, just a green recruit. Nikolai Fyodorovich put his hand in Galina's, fixing his gaze on the drooping woman now sitting at his feet. He said, switching to the familiar form of address for the first time. Forgive me, G Galia. I thought you were laughing at my aspirations, and here you are. I'm the one laughing? You think I'm crazy? Galina blurted out. Every night I sit and think only soul thoughts about how I'm going to plant herbs, real medicinal herbs, about how I'm going to use them to feed this bright-eyed falcon here to help him get, get his strength back. I'll make some real soup from fresh, fresh cabbage that don't smell of chemicals. I'll give him some real cow's milk to drink, not that fancy pasteurized stuff. And just as soon as this old bright-eyed falcon gets himself straightened out, maybe I'll even bear him a child. Me, I wasn't laughing, not one little bit. I was just saying that to see how firm a decision he'd made, to see whether he might change it in midstream. It is firm, Galena. I'm not going to change it. Well, if that's how it is, then don't chase me out to the neighborhood. Don't hand me over to some other suitor. I wasn't chasing you out, Galia. It's just that I had no idea you wanted to be with me some place other than this well-appointed mansion. I'm happy to accede your wishes, Galia. I am immeasurably grateful to you. I simply had no idea. What's there here to have no idea about? What woman would turn away from such determined soldier as yourself? Oh, I've read about Anastasia, how I've read about her. Took me a long time, it did. Had to read syllable by syllable, but still I got it right off. All us gals today need to become like Anastasia. So I've decided to be a little bit of Anastasia to you. All us gals need to become a little bit like Anastasia. She ain't got too many soldiers just yet, only a bunch of green recruits. Still wet behind the ears. Us gals gonna make em strong and make em well. Thanks, Galia. That means you, Galina Nikiforovna, have read the books and pondered them during your evenings? 
for certain. I have read all the books on Anastasia and thought about them during my evenings. Only please don't address me as a stranger any more. I have been meaning to ask you for a good time now. Just call me Galia. Okay, Galia. I was intrigued by what you said when you were offended. Really intrigued. You said we already know the philosophy of death. But as for the philosophy of life, we've still got a lot to learn. What concise formulation of two contrary philosophical tendencies? A succinct definition indeed. The philosophy of death and the philosophy of life. Simply amazing. Stroking Galina's hand excitedly and tenderly, Nikolai Fyodorovich exclaimed, You're a philosopher, Galina. I had no idea. Then he said, turning to me, There's absolutely no doubt there's so much more we need to figure out, both from the philosophical point of view and through the help of esoteric definitions. I'm trying to evaluate Anastasia as a man, a man such as we must all become. But there are certain unexplainable abilities she has which prevent us from fully appreciating her as a man like us. Vladimir, I remember you are describing an episode in which she saved people at a distance from being tortured. She saved them, but she herself, if you recall, lost consciousness, went all white over, and even the grass turned white around her. What kind of device was operating here to make her both make her, both her and the grass turn white? I've never heard of anything like that before, even though I've tried asking esoterics about it. It's not something either philosophers or physicists or esoterics know anything about. What do you mean they don't know about it? Galina burst into the conversation, still sitting on the floor at Nikolai Fyodorovich's feet. And what's there to think about when we need to scratch their eyes out? Whose eyes, Galia? Do you have your own opinions on this phenomenon? Nikolai Fyodorovich inquired and surprised. Galina was only too ready and willing to provide an answer. It's as plain as though as the nose on your face. Just as soon as man is attacked by something rotten, by some sort of wretched news or threats or cussed and anger, he goes all white, turns pale, you know. He turns pale when he don't return that anger, but burns it up within himself, meaning he gets all shook up and burns up the anger within himself, and this makes him go all white. You see lots of examples like that in life. Anastasia, too, can take this rot and burn it up within herself, and the ground goes all white, trying to help her. And as for me, well, I think you gotta scratch its eyes out. The eyes of any kind of rot, I mean. Wow, really? Many people turn pale, Nikolai Fyodorovich exclaimed in surprise, fixing his gaze on Galina, and then added, But man truly turns pale when he does not reciprocate someone's insult, but tries to keep a stiff upper lip and hold it within. He burns it up within himself, as it turns out. Why, that's true. How simple it all turns out to be. Anastasia burns up within herself the energy of aggression aimed at her. If such energy were reciprocated, it would fail to dissipate in space, but would go off and find some other target. Anastasia doesn't want anyone to be a target. Just think of all the filth that, would, that will be aimed at her. So much has been building up over centuries, and is being produced even now by the adherents of the philosophy of death. Who is strong enough to withstand such an onslaught? Tell me, who? Stay the course, Anastasia. Stay the course, noble warrior. And stay the course she will, Galina chimed in. We're going to help her now. I've started giving away your books down at the market, and the gals have been reading them now, standing around on the street corner in clutches. I gave them some cedar seeds, too. They planted them. And I told them about the healing herbs, too. The gals say, we've got to do something. Sure, we ain't going to beat up our husbands, like one of them there on the corner suggested. But we better think about who we're going to have a child with. What are you talking about, Galina? Nikolai Fyodorovich asked in surprise. Don't tell me you have your own activist group already. No way. What kind of activist group might that be? We just stand around on the street bit a bit and chit-chat about life. And where did this idea of beating up on men come from? What arguments motivated that? What do you mean, what arguments? How come our men don't come through for us? They want us to give them a child, so we give them a child, but then there ain't no nest for our, for our young'uns. And if you can't make a nest, nest, why ask for a child? What gal's going to be happy with her man when her kid just wanders around aimlessly right before her very eyes? 
Teachers come to us twice already. Teachers say some sort of psych factor stops them from getting a hold of themselves. It's all because of some kind of loan they're, they're waiting for from some foundation overseas. It's a syndrome, she says, lack of self-confidence. And this psych syndrome digs up all sorts of reasons to avoid building a nest. And the teacher went and told the gals that these loans have to be paid back in a certain number of years. Maybe 20, maybe 30, I don't remember. I only know they need to pay back a little bit more than they've been given. So it's like a man today ends up selling his own kids. What do you mean? Why would you make a comparison like that, Kalina? What do you mean, why? The men we've got today, they've been fooling around, looking to borrow money. And who will have to pay it back? For certain, that'll be their kids. The kids are just are still just youngins. Yeah, and the kids who ain't even born yet, and our kids will have to pay back even more than their dads have borrowed. When the gals began grasping the picture of the future, they started going crazy over concerns for their kids. They felt like bashing their men's snouts in. As for me, I thought we better not wait for help from anywhere. It's time we ourselves started helping these poor men of ours. I once tried a taste of that overseas sausage, and my heart broke out in tears. And I really wanted to send a piece of our Ukrainian bacon to whoever made that sausage, along with some of our own homemade sausage. Oh, my dear God, people in those countries have no idea how sausages should taste. There's no point in taking loans from people like that. That's bad money. It's no good at all. It'll bring us nothing but harm. As for beating up, I told you only one gal proposed whipping all them men. The other gals didn't go along. That, what's the point? So you can knock the last bit of sense out of them. Even so, the gals tell each other how miserable their men have made their lives. And I boast a bit, saying my man's come to his senses. He's already started making a nest. Your man? Who is he? What do you mean, who is he? I've been telling him about you. How you've gone and planted a baby cedar. How you sent me to buy you a drafting board with a large ruler. The one on the table over there. Galina indicated, pointing to the drafting table next to Nikolai Fyodorovich's desk. I told him how you asked me what trees are best to plant around the hector, and made drawings on sheets of paper at your desk, and sketched out a lovely community where good people can live. You didn't have enough room on your sheets of paper, so you asked me to bring you bigger sheets, and the board and the ruler too. I told the gals about that, and we all went together to choose the drafting board. We chose the biggest and the best we could find, and it sure cost a lot. The gal said to me, Don't be stingy, Galina. They helped me, and I could see the envy in their eyes. The bitches were jealous that my child would be born in a marvelous garden, in his own native ground, with good people all around. And I ain't mad at them for being jealous. After all, everybody wants to be happy. They pulled their money together and bought me a camera so I could take a picture of your sketch. So I could, so I took the camera and showed, and they showed me what button to press and where I should look through to take a snap. Only I never got the courage to ask your permission, so I never pressed the button. You did the right thing, Galina, not taking a photo of my design without permission. When I've finished, perhaps I shall publish it as one proposal for the new settlement. That's going to take you a long time, and the gals right now can't wait to see this lovely, loverly, beautiful future. At least to sneak a glimpse. You've managed to come up with a lovely drawing on one of them large sheets. What makes you think I shan't complete it, so complete it soon? Everything's almost all ready to be published. I have the plans and color drawings, too. That's what I said. You already have a beautiful picture. For certain it shouldn't be published for people to use, but you could still show it to the gals, the ones I meet with, and I'll just say it's not quite right yet. Nikolai Fyodorovich quickly wheeled himself over to the drafting table. I followed. There, on the table, lay plans done in colored pencil of several domains of the new settlement. The drawing showed little houses and gardens and a living fence made out of various kinds of trees. And ponds, too. The overall impression was fine, beautiful arrangements of everything. Where did you notice a mistake or an inaccuracy? inquired Nikolai Fyodorovich of Galina, who had now joined us at the drafting table. You didn't put any sun in the picture. And 
And once you get the sun in, and once you get the sun in, you have to put in shadows too. And if you're going to put in the shadows, you'll see that you can't plant any tall trees along the eastern fence. They'll give too much shade on the plant beds. The trees should be planted on the other side. Really? Maybe you're right. I wish you had told me earlier. But this is only a draft so far. Anyway, Galena, did you say you're going to have you're going to have a child? Well, it's like this. You keep on doing your exercises for now, but once you stand up on your own native ground, you'll crawl out of your catacombs. And I'll feed you with what grows in your native soil and give you a, he a healing tea to drink. And spring will come, you'll see, and everything on that native ground's going to come alive and bloom. And you'll feel your own strength again. That's when I'm going to have my child. Once again, Galina sat down on the carpet at Nikolai Fyodorovich's feet and put her hands on one of his arms resting on the side of his wheelchair. Even though she wasn't exactly a spring chicken, Galina had a strong, powerful, and attractive body. She could even be called tender and beautiful. Their conversation became more and more friendly in tone, as though they were immersing themselves in some kind of philosophy of life, while I stood around slightly stupefied, feeling like a third leg so I managed to get a word in edgewise. Excuse me, Nikolai Fyodorovich, it's time for me to be going. I don't want to be late for the plane. I'll have some pies ready for you in a flash, said Galina, getting up, and some preserves for your trip. I'll get you back to Moscow in a jiff. Nikolai Fyodorovich slowly got up from his chair, bracing himself with one hand against the table. He extended the other to me in a gesture of farewell. His handshake was firm. It no longer felt like that of an old man. Give my greetings to Anastasia Vladimir, and please let her know that the philosophy of life will definitely triumph here. Our thanks to her. I will tell her.